Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Cotts. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org. Are you ready to get into the Word? All right. You can go ahead and open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> and it will, it will take us just a bit to get there, but you can go ahead and open your Bibles there if you want. Just get ready. We're going to get very deep today, and sometimes I like to do this. I like to go into Scripture this way and to really think very deeply about things. Sometimes it's just too much, um, and sometimes I think it's unnecessary. But in my kind of journey through what the Lord wanted to release through me today, it just ended up getting there. So some of these things that we talk about today... <clears throat> Are, they may be too deep to comprehend just today, so I want to challenge you to take them home and <clears throat> continue to meditate on them, continue to bring them before the Lord, and who knows, maybe <clears throat> it'll just click today and, and we'll be in good shape, but I want to talk about purpose, and it's, it's a little bit of a shift because Last week, we were really focused on Holy Spirit and power. What are you going to do with what's inside of you? How are you going to use the gift of the Holy Spirit that has been placed on the inside of you? <clears throat> that same power that was given to Jesus that caused him to be able to do everything that he did, that came through the Holy Spirit. And today, is just not, it's going to be different. And I know it sounds like it may be the same because I said I'm going to talk about purpose, but the problem with me talking about purpose is that I don't see purpose the same way a lot of pe people see purpose. The dictionary, if you want to just have a dictionary definition of the word purpose, it means the reason for which something exists. It's the reason for which something exists. <clears throat> now, my opinion on purpose, I think, is fairly unpopular because most people define purpose and they associate purpose with what I do, what I'm supposed to do, what I'm here to do on this earth. Wouldn't you say so? Most of the time you hear the word purpose, that's what you think. What is my purpose here? What am I here to do? I don't believe that my purpose, that I exist in order to do something. It's a fairly unpopular opinion, probably not one that you would necessarily criticize. It's just not one that people... I think we generally think about. But I don't define purpose as being something that I do <clears throat> or being associated with what I do. I take it very literally. If purpose means the reason for which something exists, then my purpose is why I am alive. And I don't think it has to do with I'm alive to do something. If you think about it, the perspective that says, I am alive, I exist in order to do something, that perspective is a pretty narcissistic one. Like God created me because he needed me to do something. That's pretty narcissistic. 
God could have do God, God could have done it on his own on his own, right? <clears throat> so I, I don't really like to think of it that way, and I, I honestly don't know if I've ever thought about that way, thought about it that way. And I'm going to kind of walk you through my personal journey as far as like my purpose, if you want to call it that. But to think of God as saying the reason I'm creating Josh Cotts is so that he can leave, so that he can lead Living Word Church. That's his purpose. Once Cliff Briscoe, who, I'm, who I also created to, to found and lead Living Word Church, steps down. <clears throat> it, just, it doesn't sit right with me. That that is what was going through God's head when he decided, I'm going to make Josh so that one day he can pastor a church. I'm going to make Josh so that one day he can teach elementary music for one day a week. I'm going to make Josh so that he can marry Bailey. And I don't think it has anything to do with what I accomplish or what I do on this earth. It is the reason I'm alive. It's the reason I exist. It was what went through God's head when he decided to make me. And I guarantee you, there's no way it had to do with what I'm supposed to do. That's such a self-absorbed perspective. But this would mean, if, if, if it is... If God did create me because he wanted to, to, me to do something, or if he created me because he wanted me to pastor a church someday, this would mean that my purpose is very much wrapped up in me. It is very much about me. It's very much about what I do or what I don't do. Right? <clears throat> and there are some other issues I have with that perspective that we'll talk about. But I want to say this. Sometimes I think we're just not okay with absolutely everything being about God. Why does my purpose have to be about me? You hear me? Why does my purpose have to be about me? Why does the reason I exist have to be about me? Why can't it just be about God? And why am I not okay with the reason I exist being about God? Why does it have to be me? Why does it have to be about me? Why does it make me uncomfortable to to let it be about anything else? And this is why most people spend their lives searching for their purpose, because they think their purpose is about them. If you think your purpose is about you, you're never going to find it. And if you think your purpose is about you, that's really small and insignificant. There has to be a much grander purpose for the existence of Josh Cotts than just pastoring a church because of who made me. Pastoring a church seems like such a small and insignificant purpose when compared to the God that made me, wouldn't you say? It has to be much bigger than that. But I find it funny that sometimes we're not okay with absolutely everything being about God because ironically, God is 100% about God. Like I know there's a view of scripture that makes God about me, but maybe he is in some ways, but even greater than that, first and foremost, God is about himself. Call him selfish, Call him narcissistic, call him self-absorbed if you want. But if I was God and I knew absolutely everything, I wouldn't pretend that somebody else did. (laughs) I'm going to put myself first, (laughs) If if I was God anyway. It doesn't mean he's selfish, it doesn't mean he's prideful, it means he's God and he knows he's God, (laughs) right? In all of his love toward us, his goodness his blessings, his kindness, in him becoming flesh and dying for us, even in all of that, he was still doing it for himself. Nobody liked that one. Yeah, but Jesus died for me. No, Jesus died for the Father. His death was for me, but he did it for the Father. Everything that God does is for himself. It's for him. 
In some way, it's going to benefit him. In some way. This is going to be really difficult today because I am just going to, I might just take this huge spiritual broom and just sweep all of us out of the picture today. Because we're not included in this. We are not included in what I believe God put in me to share today. We're not a part of it. And I know that that makes us feel uncomfortable because we're like, why am I even alive then? Why am I even here? Why am I even sitting here if I'm not a part of the picture? Think about how that statement sounds, about how that thought sounds. That I, that I have to be alive and it has to be about me in order for me to even be alive. That my life has to be about me in order for me to even have a reason for existing. It's very self-centered, right? It's very self-centered. <clears throat> now, I'll prove it to you that God is completely 100% about himself. You don't have to turn there, but 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. That sounds like a really pretty statement. <clears throat> sounds like something that we'd love to rehearse and think of God as being, oh, he's always going to be faithful to me. He can't deny that he loves me so much. Once again, we're, those are self-centered statements. If you look at the context of where this verse is coming from, this verse is being pulled out of something a passage of scripture that's basically saying that even God loves you, but even if you choose to walk away from him, he's going to let you. He's going to let me walk away from him because he's going to stay faithful and true to himself. What he said was that if you don't choose me, you can't have me. I'm going to stay faithful to that. That's what that means. He, he cannot deny himself. The law of God, he cannot go against that. He cannot go against the, the promises that he's made. We like to think of the promises of God as being all these really good things and blessings toward us, but some of the promises are, if you don't choose me, you're gonna go to hell. <clears throat> That's a promise. God's not going to break that promise because he loves me. Right? So this is what this verse means. He cannot deny himself. He can let me go if I deny him, and he still will not deny himself. He puts himself first. He places himself above me. And don't we think he has a right to do that? A few of us do. I sure hope he does, because he said, you shall not have any gods before me. I would hope that he keeps that true to himself, <laughs> that he's not going to make me some kind of God that comes before him. If he's telling me that I can't have any gods before him, you can guarantee God's not going to have any gods before himself. Does this make sense? Is this too heavy right off the bat? Are you with me? God will continue to prefer himself in the end. He will. Now, have I said in any of this that God doesn't love you? Okay. Have I said in any of this that God is not crazy about you? That he doesn't want to bless you, that he doesn't want to be good to us, that he doesn't love being kind to us and, and showing us himself. Have I said that? No. That remains true, but an even truer statement, God continues to prefer himself above me. And I've come to the conclusion that I'm so glad he does. Because I don't want to serve a God that's not sure of himself. Now, when I was nine years old, I remember the service I was in. It was in Tri-City, in Seminole. I remember the moment I felt, I want to be a pastor. I want to do this with my life. And I would say, if I'm saying this morning that I don't believe your purpose is wrapped up in what you do, I think what you're meant to do on this earth could probably instead be called an appointment. 
Because an appointment, I believe you can miss. A purpose, I don't think you can avoid. Now, from the age of nine, I, I felt like I want to be a pastor. And as I grew into that, I began to see the fruit of that desire that I believe God put in my heart because that's where he was calling me. That was the appointment he made with me. And you can even look, a lot of the, the people that he called to be something, he says, I have appointed you. It's an appointment. <clears throat> but as I grew into that, I started to see the fruits of this, like people just wanted to be around me. People wanted to be over at my house all the time. Um, I, I was in middle school having school-wide parties I mean, 20, 30 kids coming over to my house for a birthday party every year. It wasn't like Sweet 16, like every year. <clears throat> it was just like this, this thing that God put in me that was like, just would just draw people. And I didn't know it at the time that that's what was going on. But looking back, I'm like, God was preparing me. Now, <clears throat> not at any moment in my life not at any moment in my life did I think, I want to be a pastor, so I need to look for an opportunity to be a pastor. I need to go out and find it. I need to apply for a job where there's a, a pastor that's needed. <clears throat> or I need to move to the right place. Or some people who feel called to be a pastor, the answer is immediately start a church. <clears throat> is that a wrong answer? No, it's not. But I would say don't start a church just because you want to be a pastor. Start a church because God told you to start a church. <laughs> or start a church because there's a need for a church in the area you're in. But don't, don't start a church because you're like, God called me to be a pastor, so I'm going to make myself a pastor now. <laughs> right? <clears throat> I never thought that way about this. I never sought it out. I became a, a worship leader for my youth group at the age of 12. Not because I asked to, but because I was asked to. At the age of 15, I started attending another youth group and I was attending both at the time. At the age of 15, I was asked to lead worship for the youth group I was a part of. I think seven years ago, sorry, at the age of 20, I was asked to be a youth pastor in Seminole. Seven years ago, Bailey and I were asked to be youth pastors and associate pastors. Three years ago, I was asked to be a senior pastor. Not any of these moments did I, th I think, <clears throat> I'm, I have to do this so much that I'm going to go out and I'm going to beg for it. I'm going to find a way to become this thing. Because I think somewhere inside my mind, I knew that's not why I exist anyway. That's not my purpose. I'll let the appointment come when it's time. But my purpose has to be greater than that. We get so bent out of shape thinking that what we are here to do is our purpose on this earth. And we go chasing these dreams and we end up unhappy and dissatisfied and not filled, discontent with what we're getting because we have turned something that's supposed to be this huge idea into something really small and insignificant. <clears throat> if I believe, I'm telling you this, if I believe that my purpose is wrapped up in being a pastor, I'm gonna be extremely unhappy because purpose has to be bigger than that. It has to be bigger than that, you guys. If you think your purpose is in what you have been appointed or called to do, you are going to be unhappy because your purpose has to be bigger than that. It has to because the God who made me is much bigger than pastor a church. And the God who made me made me giving preference to himself. <clears throat> he created me, still preferring himself above me. So whatever it is that my purpose is has to be much bigger than just Josh is going to pastor a church someday. I believe that if I were to reduce your purpose 
to what you have been called by God to do on this earth, I would be massively shortchanging you. Massively. And I don't want to do that. So my purpose is not wrapped up in what I do, it's wrapped up in why I exist. And the questions, why am I here and what am I here to do, are not the same question. Right? <clears throat> Did you hear that? We tend to make them the same question. Why I am here is, why I am, is what I am here to do. They're not the same question. Why am I here and what am I here to do are two totally different questions with two totally different answers. You hear? Now let's look at, at Ephesians chapter 2 because I want to address something real quick. <clears throat> There's a verse in the word here that sounds like it's saying that you were created to do stuff. And I want to clear this up just in case you're thinking about this. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. This says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand so that we could walk in them. Okay, there's an emphasis here on we are his workmanship, but we have been created in Christ Jesus. There's an emphasis or a reference here to not your original creation, but your rebirth. Who you have been made in Jesus. And it says that he created us in Christ Jesus for good works. Now we can read this as meaning he created us in Christ Jesus so we would go about doing all kinds of really cool stuff. But this actually literally means that you were created in Jesus for good character. Good works, works, the word works doesn't always mean service or what I'm supposed to do. Even in James, when it says faith without works is dead, what this actually means is faith without the character to back it up. A transformed person is dead. You can say you have faith, but you, if you haven't been transformed, I don't know if you have faith. That's what it's saying. So when this says that we've been created in Christ Jesus for good works, this is actually saying, I have been created in Christ Jesus or recreated that I might be good. Because before him and after the fall, I wasn't. There's no way I could walk in good works, good character. But he's recreated me. I've been reborn in Jesus for good character, to be good like him. Right? So that, that should help clear up. I don't believe that the original idea in God's mind whenever he created Josh Cotts was, I want Josh to do something. Because there's still more evidence in the word that says, that's not why I was made. And I don't know if there's any evidence in the word that says God made you to do stuff. I don't, I don't know if there's any evidence. As far as my research, I haven't found anything. But I have found a couple of things. Two reasons I believe the word tells us we were created. Turn to Revelation chapter 4. Are we going too deep yet? Or are you okay? Good. Revelation chapter 4, and I want to read verse 11. If purpose is the reason for which something exists, then what we need to discover is why we were made. Because that's the reason we exist. Right? If purpose means the reason for which something exists, we need to find out why we were made. So we need to look. We need to look into the mind of God if we can and just see if we can discover why he made us in the first place. 
What was his thinking? What was going on in his mind whenever he made us? Revelation 4.11 says, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. Some translations say that they were created for his pleasure. Anyone say that? Okay. This doesn't mean God created you to please him. God doesn't need that. He's not lacking worship. He's not lacking glory. If you're someone who's, who knows he's God, who is God and knows he's God and confident that he is God, he's not insecure. Not needing to make human beings to worship him to make him feel better about himself. So when it says that in your, in your translation, it may say that you were created or all things were created for his pleasure. It doesn't mean that they were created that they might please him. It actually means what the New American Standard is saying here. It says that because of your will, they were created. Because of his will, because of his pleasure, they were created. This is actually huge, but it's also really simple. Number one reason, or, or the first reason I want to give you why you exist and your purpose. You exist because God wanted you to exist. <clears throat> you exist because God wanted it. Now, I don't know about you, but when I first read that and started thinking about it, I was like, that can't be it. That's not enough of a reason. That's just what I thought. There has to be more. You remember being a child, asking your parents why, and they say, because I said so. <laughs> that was never enough, right? Right? You ask God, why did you make me? Because I said so. <laughs> That's not enough. I want more. There has to be more than that. You can't, you can't tell me that my reason for existing is because you wanted me to exist. What do I do with that? What can I do with that? Do you hear what I'm saying? Do you hear what I sound like? Once again, I've made it about me. Once again, I've, I've figured out a way to make it about me. That's not enough, God. I need more. Tell me what I'm here to, what, tell me what I'm here to do. What do you want from me? I wanted you to exist. Yeah, but, but me. <laughs> You're not thinking about me. Was I supposed to? Like sitting there thinking, for, for whatever reason, I think I was supposed to be involved in the creation of me. Like, God, you should have taken some pointers and asked me for some advice before you just got busy making me. <clears throat> like, where was I in all of this? I made you because I wanted to. <sighs> that can be tough for people who might be depressed, who hate their life who don't want to live anymore, and you tell them they're alive because God wanted them to live. I don't want to tear anyone or anything down, but I'm asking, what other reason do we need? Why do we need more than that? And why can't that be just a beautiful reason? Yeah, but nobody loves me. First of all, most of the time that's not true. Second of all, God made you because he wanted to make you. Obviously, he loves you. Can that not be enough of a reason? <clears throat> the reason I think we would read something like this and think, 
there's no way that's it. There has to be more. Two, two reasons I think we would think that. The problem we take with a statement like that, God made you because he wanted to make you. Number one reason it would make us uncomfortable is because it has nothing to do with us. Zero. It has literally nothing to do with me. God made me because he wanted to make me? That has nothing to do with me. And that makes me uncomfortable. Not me, Joe. Speaking for all of us. <laughs> but it takes me and what I want out of the picture entirely. And the other thought that I have is, <clears throat> if God made me because it was his will, he wanted to make me, why do I think my will will ever be more important than his? If the very reason I exist is because of what he wanted. I'm literally created on a foundation of the will of God. And yet sometimes I argue that my will might be better than his. And he is up there saying, my will is what created you. You would not even be here if it weren't for what I want. So I'm like, don't you think we ought to let God have what he wants? Yeah. Right? Yes. The other reason I think we might read this and <clears throat> be uncomfortable with the fact that the reason we exist is simply because God wanted us to exist is because it's proof that I'm not in charge of my own purpose. <clears throat> right? If, if I exist simply because God wanted me to exist, I had nothing to do with it. It was no conversation God had with me. He didn't ask me first. <laughs> it's proof that I'm not in charge of my reason for existing. I'm not in charge of my purpose. <clears throat> I think a lot of ministers, I've heard a lot of ministers say, you can't escape God's purpose for your life. It's a very true statement when it's said in the right context. If you think your purpose is what you're here to do, you can very well escape that. But when we think of purpose as the reason I exist, that is something that's entirely unavoidable, which means I'm not included in it at all. If I were, I could avoid it. If I were, I could escape it. But your purpose, your reason for existing, lies in the one who made you exist in the first place, the reason he made you. And the first reason is because he wanted to make you. <clears throat> you can see that as depressing or liberating. Either way, it remains true. He created all things because of his will. Are you with me? <clears throat> now look at Isaiah chapter 43. You want to go deeper? Let's do it. Isaiah 43. <clears throat> Isaiah 43, verse 7. This is God speaking through Isaiah. He says, Everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. He says, Whom I have created for my glory. Created for my glory. Everyone say this. I was created <coughs> for his glory. He says, I have created everyone for my glory. Everyone. Everybody say everyone. everyone. He says, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. Everyone was created for his glory. Now, we might interpret this as we exist to give him glory. But that's not what it says. 
This says, this doesn't say that I exist to give him glory. This says I exist for his glory. He will get glory from my existence, not from what I can do with my existence. You hear me? There's even an old worship song. I remember, I was created to worship. You ever heard that one? First time I heard it, I was like, that's not right. <laughs> I know that that's really harsh, but the first time I heard it, I was going, was I though? There's no way God created me to worship him. Like I said, he's not insecure. Why would he create me for that purpose, to worship him? I get to worship him, and I should worship him, but it's not why I exist. You hear me? I get to give him glory. I get to bring him glory, whether it is in my worship, my prayer time, my offerings, whatever it may be, but it's not why I'm here. This says that I exist for his glory, not I exist to give him glory. <clears throat> this says I exist for his worship, not I exist to worship him. Do you hear me? I'll explain this. Now here's the deal. If I exist and if everyone that, that was made, he made for his glory, this means don't, don't yell at me. This means that whether I go to hell or go to heaven, whether I choose him or I do not choose him, somehow my existence will bring him glory. Because he created me for his glory. Right? It's not optional. This is the reason I exist, for his glory. Whether I worship him or I don't worship him, he gets glory simply by me being on the earth. Isn't that crazy? Now, I know your wheels are turning and you're, think, you're thinking like, okay, um, if I don't choose him, how does he get glory? Like, if, if, if I don't choose him, how does he benefit from my existence? The problem with that way of thinking is it puts you in charge of his glory. That I can decide whether God gets glory from my life. When I wasn't even in charge of deciding whether I would be here. <laughs> right? There's a huge flaw in that way of thinking. <clears throat> the dirtiest sinner on the planet at the end of his or her life, because there are only two genders, <laughs> at the end of his or her life, God will get glory from their existence. I'm gonna explain myself. Some of you are like, hold on a minute. <laughs> I don't believe in universalism, I don't. So that's not what I'm preaching right now. Because what I do or don't do in this life is not going to affect whether God gets glory from my life at the end of my life. It will only affect whether I get to know his glory, whether I get to be in his glory, whether I get to see his glory, but it won't affect him from receiving glory. You hear me? So what this does is it puts me not in charge of what God gets, but in what, of what I get, which is how it's supposed to be. I have to stop seeing myself as someone who's in charge of what God receives. <laughs> I'm only in charge of what I receive, right? Now, trust me, God loves it whenever, you know, whenever lost souls come to know him and receive Jesus and all of that. It, it does benefit him greatly, but whether they did or not, he would get the glory anyway. So how does this work? If, well, let me, let me read this first. Um, Isaiah 42, 8. You, you can look at the previous chapter. This is proof. Isaiah 42, 8, God says, I am the Lord, that is my name. I love that so much. 
just in case you needed a reminder. I'm the Lord, (laughs) not you. Uh, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. I can make all the idols I want on the earth, and it's not going to steal any glory from God. He remains unaffected by my worship or lack thereof. Do you hear me? He remains unaltered, unchanged by the glory I give him or lack thereof. He remains unchanged by whether I live for him or not. Now, you might be thinking, well, Josh, it sounds like you're saying I can live however I want and it's okay. No, it's not okay for you. It's okay for him. It's not going to affect him. (laughs) Of course, he's going to be sad. He wants everyone. I mean, his will is that none should perish. That's what he wants, right? But he's still going to get glory from me being alive, even if I run the furthest I can from him. He gets glory because that's why he made me, was for his glory. He made me because he wanted to make me, and he made me for his glory. So it's not an option. It's not something I can escape. He says, I'm not going to give that glory to anybody else. It's coming to me. (laughs) At the end of the day, at the end of your life, it's coming back to me in some way. Again, this is difficult for us to hear because it's not about me. (laughs) It's not about us in any way. It's just about him and what he gets and how he gets to benefit from just making me. My purpose. My purpose at the end of the day, wouldn't you know, just ends up not being about me at all. Just ends up being about him. And it makes sense because God's about him. (laughs) God, who is in charge of his own glory, created me that he might receive glory from my existence on the earth. Every person on this earth passively brings glory to God simply by being alive, alive, whether they like it or not. This is what this is saying, that he created me for his glory. Did you hear that? Every person on this earth passively brings glory to God, whether they like it or not. Just their existence, not in their decisions, not always in their decisions. Our decisions can bring glory to God, right? But even if you never did anything for God or with him, never even looked at him or believed in him, rest of your life, you're still going to glorify him. He gets glory just from you being alive. Even though our actions can't prevent God from receiving glory from our lives, our actions can prevent us from knowing his glory. So how is this possible? How is it possible that just my purpose, the reason which I exist, which one of these reasons is for his glory, that he may receive glory just from me walking around on the earth? We have to go back to the beginning to figure this out. How is it that God gets glory from my existence even if I never choose him? That's because if you read in the beginning, every single person that has ever and will ever walk the face of this earth has been made in the image of God. In his image. Now, you might think that that image changed in the garden after man fell. That's not true. The image never changed. It was the perception of the image that changed. See, Adam and Eve had been naked before. What changed after they sinned was they looked down and saw themselves differently. It was the way the image was seen, it was the way the image was perceived that changed, but the image remained the same, that every person you look at is the image of God, in fact. Nothing changes. Now, if that's the case, everyone being made in the image of God, this would mean that in some way, in some way, I must look at least a little bit like him. Right? So creation can't help, but every time they look at me, they're reminded of him. Whether I like it or not, every time I look at you, I'm reminded of him. Something about you is representative of him because you were made in his image. And 
it doesn't change. The people that you encounter that are just filthy, rotten sinners, if you want to call them that, whatever. You know, everyone's sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I mean, come on. They're still the image of God. They were made that way. So I would say, how is it that my life, my existence, can passively bring glory to God? It's because I'm a reminder of him. I draw attention back to him, <clears throat> whether I like it or not. He gets the glory because his image is walking on the earth. <clears throat> the image of himself is walking on the earth. He gets the recognition. And even if I don't choose him and I end up going to hell, who am I going to meet right after I die? <laughs> who am I going to look in the eye? Who am I going to have to answer to? He's going to get glory. He gets glory from that. That he'll get glory from that moment. And it's not something that he's like, you know, totting around or anything like that. It's just he'll go, get, get glory from that moment because at last he's revealed to the person who didn't want to look him in the face. He's recognized for who he is and what he is. And in that moment, he will get honor even if it means that that person can't stick around. This is, <clears throat> this is difficult. But the, the reason I'm bringing this up, especially the part about glory in accordance with purpose, is because I'm sure when I told you at the very beginning I was going to be talking about purpose, I'm sure you had a, maybe a momentary thought, a fleeting thought. You were like, I'm going to walk out of here today knowing what I'm supposed to do with my life. <clears throat> and here I am saying your purpose is, in fact, not about you at all. How liberating that is. This, this thing that so many people chase their entire lives, purpose. And the purpose for your life is going to be fulfilled, whether you like it or not. And there's something there to just rest in. It doesn't mean you don't do anything at all. It doesn't mean, I'm not saying that you need to just live a life without works. You're going to serve your purpose anyway. That's not what I'm saying. You guys know what I'm saying. You stop chasing this, this empty dream that really is this idea that was formed by man in the first place. That the reason you're here is to do something. Stop chasing that as your purpose and just understand the purpose for your life, the reason you exist, the reason you are alive right now is because God wanted you to be alive for his glory. This means that, I mean, so what can we do then other than just decide that everything I do needs to come back to his glory? Everything I do needs to be wrapped up in his will and his glory. If that's the reason I'm here, then God, I want to partner with you in making sure you get both of those things. <clears throat> that your will is fulfilled in my life and that you get the glory in everything that I do. You can stop stressing and sweating about what you're supposed to do tomorrow and rest in your purpose and let what you do flow out of your purpose. Let your actions come out of God made you because he wanted to make you and he made you for his glory. Is that liberating and freeing? Can we rest in that? And I challenge you to also continue to meditate on this because I know it's a lot and it's different. But this is, this is something I think could benefit all of us, just knowing that. Don't chase the American dream. Don't chase what people tell you you're supposed to do. Chase God. Rest in your purpose. Go after him. And just like a story I told you with just this, my appointments being handed to me. Let that happen. 
rest in your purpose and just let God hand you these appointments. Let God make appointments with you and meet them. Meet his call. Amen. All right, stand with me. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Cotts. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org.